Ladies and gentlemen, it's for me a pleasure to address you today and share with you some thoughts on the post-COVID-19 challenges that lie ahead and what I think could be done to properly address them as well as to seize the opportunities that are likely to arise. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has presented countries with enormous policy challenges. Overall, one can say that fiscal and monetary authorities acted assertively to address the economic impact of the health crisis on the lives of our citizens and corporates. In the financial sector, legislators, regulators and supervisors have tried to strike a balance between providing flexibility to stimulate lending and maintaining reliable metrics in line with the single rule book, even during these times of extreme stress. The latter thing was necessary to maintain an accurate picture on risk evolving in banks and the banking sector more broadly so as to provide continued assurance on the robustness of the sector. Almost two years after the COVID-19 outbreak, EU banks seem to be coping very well with it. Banks have been able to preserve ample levels of capital and liquidity throughout the pandemic, while at the same time providing lending and restructuring capabilities to their customers. Capital and liquidity ratios have improved since early 2020, the NPL ratio has maintained its decreasing train, albeit at a slower pace, and currently stands at 2.3%. More importantly, the recently published stress test results of the 2021 EU-wide stress test show that overall, banks will be able to withstand a severe economic scenario characterized by the prolongation of the pandemic in a lower for longer interest rate environment. The results show that after an assumed 3.6% cumulative drop in EU GDP over a three-year horizon, banks fully loaded capital will remain above 10% on the average for EU banks. Of course, there's a distribution around that average. However, 90% of the banks in the sample would maintain an excess capital over the total swept capital requirements of at least 219 basis points. However, it's also true that some weak banks will end up with capital below the required capital ratio. It is also noteworthy that in contrast to previous crises, the COVID-19 pandemic has so far resulted in a decrease in corporate bankruptcies. Tax breaks, follow schemes, moratorium, public guarantee schemes, and above all, the temporary suspension of insolvency regimes have resulted in bankruptcy declarations in the EU to decrease by around 35% in the first half of last year. And although they have thereafter rebounded, they're still below the five-year average today. Hence, as support measures expires, it's likely that asset quality will suffer. Indeed, rising volumes of non-performing loans are already observed in some of the sectors most affected by the pandemics, such as hospitality and related industries. Even though the cost of risk has returned to pre-pandemic levels, the overall share of loans classified under IFRS 9 Stage two remains 2% 2 poised above its pre-pandemic level. The share of stage two loans is particularly high among those loans that are still under moratoria as well, for, as well as for those that have already exited moratorias. In addition, the NPR ratios for moratoria loans stand also well above the average. A similar deter deterioration is observable for those loans under public guarantee schemes. Therefore, Vulnerabilities are there, and they're also simmering in traditional safer loan portfolios. The low level of interest rates combined with pent-up household savings and abundant liquidity is also driving up housing prices at a very fast pace in many EU countries, so that in case of an abrupt price correction, those banks more exposed to mortgage loans might experience a decrease in the value of their collateral. The last 18 months have also, increased, has also seen increases in technology-related risks. This risk might cause significant disruptions in bank operations going forward. In fact, cyber attacks have become more frequent and aggressive in the last months. Also, the ransomware episodes, mainly observed in other economic sectors than the financial industry for the moment, could also similarly affect banks going forward. So notwithstanding the benefits of digitalization for consumers, which are clear, it's also fair to acknowledge that banks' clients are now more exposed to phishing attempts and that less digital savvy customers run the risk of being left behind. The pandemic as well has accelerated banks' technological transformation with more client operations moving to the internet and wide applications of teleworking arrangements. This is vital for banks' competence going forward and also allows employees and clients 
to benefit from the use of digital solutions in terms of cost, accessibility, and convenience. The COVID-19 crisis has proven that the regulatory reforms agreed at the global level in the aftermath of the global financial crisis have been successful overall in strengthening banks' resilience. The long-term impact of COVID-19 is still to be determined. However, I think that high capital, ample liquidity, improved asset quality, and a stronger risk management have all helped banks to restore to respond to the emergency. Now, this confirms to me the importance of the final implementation of Basel III, and I welcome the Commission commitment on this front by putting forward last week a legislative proposal. The Basel III framework increases the risk sensitivity of the standard approaches and limits the ability to model in areas where availability of data has been known to be difficult to assist, and at the same time, the models have less observations and therefore they're less reliable. Keeping our goal to preserve a global level playing field and to avoid regulatory fragmentation should be a key principle going forward as we approach the final implementation of this reform. As economic restrictions are lifted and businesses reopen, Banks need to differentiate between the viable and non viable companies going forward. Some business businesses have suffered more than others, either due to the direct shock to their business from the COVID crisis or due to the lack of a viable business model that can adjust to the trends in the economy. Some others will also not have future because further structural changes, such as I was thinking before, the reorientation to more digital economies or sustainability going forward. We all recognize the crucial role that banks have played in ensuring the continued flow of lending. And now more than ever, banks need to be proactive in, in identifying struggling borrowers and non-performing exposures and addressing those challenges appropriately. The single rule book with harmonized definitions of default and forbearance should ensure that banks set aside high amount of capital for the risky of liars and a level playing field. On the other hand, Viable households and companies should have sufficient access to finance. In any case, borrowers experiencing financial difficulties and banks should proactively work together on a one-on-one -on -one basis in finding the most appropriate solution for each individual circumstance. Some firms, for instance, may find themselves over leveraged, and more equity-type financing could be more appropriate to them rather than bank lending. In these cases, I think banks' role of acting as an intermediary will remain important in advising those customers. Also, in that context, the completion of the Capital Markets Union agenda could contribute to ensure a strong and robust recovery. In that sense, I think regulators need to support banks' efforts in managing loan restructuring, as well as potential inflows of non-performing loans after the COVID-19. At the ABA, we are actively working in this area with other authorities under the Comprehensive Commission's Action Plan launched in the survey last year to manage uh, forthcoming MPLs. We're playing an important role in improving data standardization to, fa to facilitate the sale of those MPLs and for to the function of the secondary markets for them. <coughs> All of these efforts should help banks better prepare to a potential MPL increase in the aftermath of the pandemic and also manage that increase. In addition to asset quality concerns, with banks need to enhance their technological transformation. And at the same time, it's also fair to assess the banks also need to address their already long-run problems of a structural low profitability. The average return on equity of the industry has been below the cost of equity for a number of years, and during the pandemic, the increase in impairment costs drove the ratio to a minimum of 0.5% in June of last year. As impairment costs have receded over the last year, the return on equity levels recovered to around 7.5% in June of this year, however, is still below the estimated cost of equity. Those banks that are unable to attain sustainable profitability levels after the return to normality should consider their business strategies. Consolidation could play a role in this process. Through M&As, banks might be able to eliminate redundancies in operating expenses and to exploit existing economies of scale and synergies, for instance, through investments in digitalization that benefit the merged entity. Before concluding, I would now want to finish with also calling your attention on two salient risks for which we need to enhance our regulatory toolkit. The recent anti-money laundering challenges in a number of jurisdictions brings to our attention that the legal, economic, and reputational consequences of insufficient and ineffective controls in place on AML 
can last for several years and might affect not only the involved institutions, but the entire trust on the banking sector. The introduction of new technologies and massive digitalization is showing us that additional risks arise, but also that more opportunities are provided to financial authorities to enhance their ability to crack down on those illegal activities. The European Commission has launched an ambitious legislative proposal earlier this year. That proposal strengthens the AML regulatory and supervisory framework in the EU. We think this is a major stop a step for going forward, and I strongly supported it. But in the interim, we should continue to enhance the existing framework to tackle those risks. The ABA, we have recently launched a public consultation on new guidelines on the role, tasks, and responsibilities of AML compliance officers. The guidelines require these officers to have a sufficient level of seniority, which entails the power to propose on their own initiative, unnecessary or appropriate measures to ensure the compliance and effectiveness of the internal AML measures to the management body. Similarly, inadequately addressed environmental, social or governance factors might have detrimental consequences on banks and financial stability. All institutions need to continue to enhance their governance, risk management and toolkits to better identify, measure and address these risks. The ABA published in June its report on ESG risk management and supervision, where we provided a comprehensive proposal on how ESG factors and ESG risks should be included in the regulatory and supervisory framework. The report outlined the impact that ESG factors, especially climate change, can have on institutions, counterparties, or invested assets. It also compiled available indicators and metrics for an effective ESG risk management and identified remaining gaps in the area. Banks need to assess their strategy with regard to ESG risk. They need to evaluate the climate-related risk existing in, in their portfolios right now. We published last May the results from a pilot-sensitive analysis on climate risk on a sample of EU volunteer banks. The main objectives of this exercise was to explore data and methodology challenges that banks have to categorize exposures that could potentially be vulnerable to climate risk and to assess their readiness to apply the EU green taxonomy. I can very quickly summarize to you the results by indicating that much more work needs to be done in measurement, in methodology, in risk management and assessment before we can feel comfortable that an active management of ESG related risk is taking place in banks. We believe banks need to start collecting and disclosing information on their key exposures and strategies related to climate risk more thoroughly. We will be proposing a sequential approach for the implementation of the prudential disclosure requirements, starting with quantitative information on climate change related risks, including transition and physical risks, the implementation of a green asset ratio on the EU taxonomy aligned activities, which translate the Paris Agreement, as well as quantitative information on other mitigating actions and qualitative disclosures for environmental, social and governance risks. We will expect banks to start reporting this information as of 2023. Steps need to be taken by all stakeholders to advance in this agenda. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good day.